Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Vikas Agrawal and I am the founder of AIF and PMS Experts India. So, you know, AIF is Alternate Investment Funds uh, and PMS is your Portfolio Management Services. So, we are emerging as one of the largest platform for investing in alternate investments and portfolio management services. Well, mutual fund to sahi hai. I mean, no denying on the fact that mutual fund brings about more than uh, almost two, two decades of consistent track record. But what is happening is of late, we are witnessing huge value migration wherein investors are not only investing in mutual fund, they are also investing in, in capital markets to PMS and AIFs. Uh, and we as an organization, we bring about a lot of data analytics in terms of helping all our investors to choose the right fund. And at AIF and PMS Experts India, uh, some of you might be aware that we keep organizing these value uh, knowledge-based sessions. That's the biggest value add that we can give it to all our viewers and investors. So uh, with me this time, I have Mr. Aditya uh, from Ingrid uh, uh, Asset Management Company. Well, Aditya doesn't need uh, introduction. Uh, he is there on CNBC and most of the media channels and have been speaking with a lot of investors. If I have to uh, uh, introduce him, I would say that he is farmer specialist. That's the best way to introduce Aditya. Well, Aditya brings about almost 18 years of long, uh, uh, you know, I would say experience, long track record in terms of uh, managing public money under uh, both mutual fund and PMS platform. So he's He's all his life is into uh, uh, pharma and last time we had a chance to read his mind through webinars and uh, uh, you know it had more than 20,000 uh, views. Uh, so this time we thought a lot of things happening on the pharma. So we'll try and read his mind and understand what's sure. happening. So Aditya, uh, you know, you began your career uh, as part of the uh, uh, pharma company, you know, as you, you're part of the treasury. And then you went on to become fund, manage, fund manager and started managing clients' money. So we'll start with that first. And then I'll come to the straight away first question of what is your uh, view on pharma? So uh, if you can just share your experience of last 18 years with our viewers. Sure, I'll do that. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and it's a pleasure to connect with your audience. Um, yeah, so I started my career with this company called Glenmark Pharmaceuticals. They're based out of Mumbai. Right. I was a part of their treasury. The job was to manage the cash flow of the company, the debt, the inventory, and also to look at the diligence of the companies which they wanted to acquire back in right. those days. Right. Now, we did that for about two years and then, you know, I got an offer from uh, a company called Lehman Brothers and investment. Sure. Bank. Right. Uh, I work for Lehman Brothers and I joined them in January of 2008. So, slightly unfortunate yeah. on the timing. Right. But I would say it's very fortunate also because in those 10 months that I worked for Lehman, right. I learned how the US generic pharma companies work. Sure. So, you and went to US? I went to US. And, uh -huh. and the US generic pharma companies are actually one of the largest competitors of the Indian pharma companies right. when we sell like products to the US. So, it was very interesting to see how the competitors work, how they strategize and how their stock prices are derived and all that. So it was a great experience. After Lehman bankruptcy, I joined Nomura London. Mm -hmm. And again, the job was to track the European pharma companies. So GSK, no, right. Sona, Sanofi, Novartis, these are all mm -hmm. uh, European pharma names. Did that for about three odd years. Right. And then came to India and joined Ambit and then DSP, mm -hmm. all, you know, right. uh, looking at Indian healthcare. Sure. And while at DSP, I launched the DSP Healthcare Mutual mm -hmm. Fund, uh, which turned out to be pretty good performing right. for the investors. Yes, I remember that. Yes. And uh, uh, in February of 21, at Incredible, we launched the healthcare PMS, mm. which I currently manage. Right. So that's been my journey. It's been pharma throughout, but it's right. been different pockets of pharma. I've seen Latin America, I've seen America, I've seen Europe, I've seen India. Yeah. So it's a very uh, different business model across the world right. because companies work differently to make money, and that's right. very very enticing to me. Right, right. No, so what is happening is particularly coming to your subject, uh, Aditya. Uh, you know, uh, people are not able to make money in uh, pharma. And I would say there is a bloodbath in the sense that you see even the largest company like DVs or like uh, Dr. Lal Path or there are some large companies like Sun Pharma. Investors are losing money out here. So, uh, first of all, these companies that I am talking about is just for the example and yes. we have nothing against those companies. Now, when, when we are talking to you as a fund manager, so you have been tracking this sector for a long, long time now. Can you just talk to our investors and share your experience? Where are we and where are we headed? 
Sure. So instead of taking names of companies, I'll actually divide the entire healthcare universe in five buckets and I'll sure. talk to you about what is happening in each of these buckets sure. and what is the outlook. Right? right. So the first bucket that we look at is the unbranded generic bucket. This is by far the largest bucket. Now in this comes almost all your large care pharma companies, mm. your Sun Pharma, your Cipla, your Dr. Reddy, Cadilla, they're all you know lying in this bucket. Now these companies are actually conglomerates, they do multiple businesses but their largest business is the business of selling products to US. Okay. Now you have to understand that the US generic market is an unbranded market. Mm -hmm. When I say it's an unbranded market what I mean is that the only buying decision that is made by the patient mm -hmm. is made on the basis of the price of the product. There is no brand on the generic product. I it's see. an unbranded generic. So there is no brand. The product is called by the name of the salt. So for instance, paracetamol is called paracetamol. It's not called any other name. So whether Dr. Reddy's manufactures it or Sun manufactures it, it will be called para paracetamol. Okay. Now when a patient goes to the pharmacy and he wants paracetamol, the decision of whether he buys Dr. Reddy's product or Sun product or Cipla's product will probably be based on at what price are they available. Mm -hmm. Whoever is the cheapest, the patient is very likely to buy that because in his mind he's buying paracetamol Paracetamol, why should we even pay right, a cent extra right. Right, for any other company? And what is the size of the market? So US pharma market today is a $500 billion market. It's a huge market. And uh, of those generics is about $70, $80 billion. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean the patented molecules are 3% of the volume, but 90% of the market size. And the generic products are 97% uh, of the 97% of the volume, mm. but they are about 12% uh, of the market size. So this is not a homegrown market. So who is the biggest supplier there? So uh, country-wise, uh, country-wise, yeah. So uh, India is the largest country uh, in the US. Uh, we account for almost today 60% of the volume of generics in US. 60, right. 60, and this number 15 years back used to be 10%. Hmm. So from 10 to 60, the journey has been phenomenal okay. and all companies including Sun, Dr. Eddie, Sipla, Cadillac, sure. they've all done their uh, role, you know, in this. Okay. They've uh, spent a lot of money in CapEx and R&D right. to be able to sell products in US. Hmm. Uh, but this bucket, you know, made money for these companies in 2010 to 15. Uh, back then, my assessment is that the demand for generics was X and the supply was 0.8x. It was lower than demand. Mm. Now, because the supply was less than demand and it is purely a commodity business, no branding, no differentiation. But even in a commodity business, when the demand outstrips supply, mm -hmm. you can charge a good price because there is a scarcity premium right. attached to the price. Right. Now, that 2010 to 15 era, all these companies, you know, literally made tons, made of, money, tons of money. Tons of money. But because they were so immensely profitable in a commodity market, what that ended up doing is it ended up attracting a lot of competition. Mm. Now those competitors started entering the market after 2015. Mm. Now as you can appreciate in a commodity, as a new entrant, you have no other choice but to cut price to get market share. You cannot Adri. differentiate your product. Adri. There is no branding. True. So the only way you can get market share from an incumbent mm -hmm. is by cutting the price. And reduce your margin. And reduce the margin for the incumbent also and for yourself also. And you will do that Then the next new entrant who comes will cut your price. You will have to meet his price. All right. So you know so that never is ending ocean. never ending process. So today, so that is what has exactly been happening for the last seven years. And today we have reached a level where, you know, the demand in US is X, the supply is one and a half X. Oh. It is way more than demand. And therefore the pricing of products in US is absolutely, you know, at their historic lows and it's getting worse every day mm -hmm. because the prices still keep eroding because new entrants keep entering the market. So the stocks which did well in that 2010 to 15 era, these unbranded generic companies, uh, you know, they had an opportunity, they milked the opportunity sure. but that opportunity just doesn't exist anymore hmm. and which is but that is still a very large part of the index is almost 45 to 50 percent of the BSE healthcare index hmm. is these companies which are unbranded yeah, these are large weights. and these are large weights very very large weights 10 15 percent weight each of those and there are six seven companies like that so your total weight is about 50 percent hmm. um, so we don't invest in that bucket much because we don't like the business model as it is today we know there was a good time we know potentially there can be a good time few years down the road not few months not few weeks mm -hmm. few years maybe five years ten years seven years down the road maybe the supply will reduce again it will become less than demand and maybe these companies will again make money but that is still at least five years away if mm -hmm. not more mm -hmm. so therefore today we are not investing in these companies okay. we don't like this bucket but it is the largest chunk of our benchmark which is the healthcare index so that is the first bucket that is the first bucket. Now the biggest problem this bucket has is inflation. 
in inflation when raw material prices go up because you are undifferentiated sure. you cannot increase prices say mm -hmm. if we are the two players in that one molecule mm -hmm. and the raw material cost for both of us has gone up 10 percent if i increase my price by 10 percent to pass on the cost and you don't mm -hmm. you get all my market share right so you see the problem here mm -hmm. in an inflationary scenario this commodity business cannot do well mm -hmm. simply because there is no ability to pass on the cost. To the but what if are they, there are other countries also, no, yes. the bigger size. So yeah. if US is $500 billion, there would be some other countries. So are these companies not focusing on those artists? No. Uh, so the global pharma market is $1.2 trillion, $1,200 billion, mm -hmm. of which US alone is $500. That's the largest. One. That's the, by far the largest. The second mm -hmm. largest is Europe, which is about $130, $140 billion. Sure. That's the second largest. The third largest is China, which is $90 billion, $100 billion. Oh, so spread is very high. The spread is very, very high. So which is why all these pharma companies focus on the US a lot more and Europe Europe actually majority of the Western European countries the government procures there are tenders so even in tenders the pricing is equally bad because you know it's again competitive they are in that they, they sort of seek bids for the medicines and multiple companies bid for supplying those medicines and again the pricing becomes lower because right, there are aggressive right. bids and the same problem so in the world market today to my understanding there are seven to eight unbranded generic markets mm -hmm. out of 200 potential markets sure. and the balance 192 are all branded generic but those are small markets and this six seven unbranded they are very large markets mm -hmm. so you know there is a popular conception amongst people they feel that if uh, a branded so india for instance is a branded generic right. market and investors feel that if branded generic were to become unbranded generic the prices will come down mm -hmm. that doesn't happen data doesn't prove that us which is the most expensive pharma market in the world is completely unbranded western europe again very expensive pharma market second most expensive unbranded japan china unbranded australia unbranded oh so all these large pharma markets south africa unbranded okay so all these large pharma markets they are large because they are unbranded see what branded generic does is it keeps the bargaining power with the pharma company mm -hmm. a pharma company is an institution they are responsible they want the drugs to have high volume mm -hmm. they price with great discipline mm -hmm. what unbranded does is it shifts the bargaining power to the channel now channel has multiple arms there's a wholesaler retailer right, right. cfa agent each of them will become greedy each of them will have their own and these are not organized people these are small small right, small entities right. so they can you know milk the, a lot more margin than mm -hmm. the pharma company and their dependency is too high on them so they would tend to take miss they would advantage undue advantage undue advantage and that is exactly what is happening in us drugs are not cheap in us we keep talking about price erosion in the us market that doesn't mean that the end consumer is buying cheap he's right. not is actually paying a fairly good price mm. is the pharma company which is getting lesser and lesser because the middleman is keeping more and more understood so which is why we don't like this business so model. this back it you're not really focusing absolutely on. not focused on this is less than 10 percent allocation in our portfolio in the index it is more than 45 percent about 50 percent allocation so big chunk you are ignoring i'm it? ignoring one of the largest chunks i'm very consciously doing that we have been doing this successfully for the past five years it has helped us in the past five years sure. and we are sure it will help us for the next five years as well i see so that is why we don't do this the second uh, bucket uh, uh, that we like and where the outlook is also very positive is the branded generic bucket mm -hmm. now these are basically companies that focus on the other 192 markets mm -hmm. of which the biggest market is india the mo the largest branded generic market in the world is india about 25 billion dollars okay right and um, you know this is the bucket where you are branding mm -hmm. so when in a branded generic market when the patient goes to the pharmacy he carries a prescription which mentions a particular brand he is not bothered about the price he just wants the drug which the doctor has prescribed to him and therefore he doesn't look out for the price he's not looking for the cheapest drug he's looking for that brand mm. and therefore the pharma companies in this market actually behave like fmcg companies they say that it is my brand that sells my product not my cost mm -hmm. so they do not even manufacture a majority of what they sell what they do is they get it third party manufactured they brand it and they promote the brand sure. they make sure that the end consumer reaches there right. the brand recall is there mm -hmm. so their job in this market is not to manufacture cheap can you give us some examples for the audience sure so uh, indoco remedies in the recent con call uh, in the 3q con call they mentioned that a lion's share of the products they sell in india are outsourced and when they say lion's share they meant more than 80 90 percent of what they sell in india is outsourced all of you will have medicines at your home right so just turn over the uh, leaf of the medicine mm -hmm. behind the leaf it would say 
manufactured by XXX, marketed by XXS. There will be different companies. Marketed by company will be known to you. Sun Pharma, right. Lupin, Sipla, right. Indoco, right. Ipka. Yeah. But uh, manufactured by company will not be known to you right. because it's a B2B business company. Yeah. So and you, most of the time we ignore, we don't re really uh, You don't see yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how yeah. things are. But yeah. Yeah. So people know Hindustan liver, right. right? People don't know who manufactures the soaps for Hindustan in liver. Yeah. It's the same thing. Actually. It's the same thing. You know Sun Sipla, you know Ipka, you know Indoco. Right. You don't know who manufactures for them. So these businesses you feel will do well selectively? So, huh. so they will do well. I'll tell you why. So one, the branding. So branding ensures that there is pricing power. US market or unbranded genetic market, price falls every year. Mm -hmm. Branded genetic market <coughs> price goes up every year. It's a complete U-turn, sure. right? So in an inflationary environment, you have the ability to pass on the cost mm. to the customer right. because you're taking price increases, right? right? Now, the second most important thing here is it's an asset light business. Mm -hmm. So in the US, because your objective is to sell at the cheapest price, you have to do everything on your own. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to pay margins to someone else. Right. You manufacture the raw material, you do the packaging, you do the finished product, you do the logistics, you do everything on your own to keep as much margin possible as you can inside your company. But in India, everything is outsourced. Mm -hmm. They do only the branding and promotion on their own because that is the most important part. Everything else they give it to somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. So it's asset light. You don't need assets to do this business. It's again like HUL. Understood. They don't need assets. They need people to promote. Yeah. They need advertising. They need promotion. But they don't need the manufacturing footprint to make soaps and oils. So very similarly here. So it's an asset light business. Therefore, margins are healthy. Pricing power. Asset light, margins are good, ROE is excellent, mm -hmm. beyond imagination ROEs some of these companies make. Mm -hmm. And that is why we like the business, because you don't need to reinvest the mm -hmm. cash flows that you make. You can just pay it off as dividends. But is buybacks. there any uh, regulation that you can have maybe 100% or not more than 100% margins or something like that? Do you use any government no. intervention here? No. So government intervenes in the sense that so there is a list of medicines, about 300 odd medicines, mm -hmm. uh, which are mentioned. And this is, list is called the National List of Essential Medicines. Sure. And this NLEM, National List of Essential Medicines, government fixes the price that okay. you can't sell above this price. I see. Uh, but that number of drugs is only about 20% of our market <coughs> today. The rest 80% of the market you can price any way you want. Oh. So then the companies you know try to launch more products on that side to ensure their overall business margins mm -hmm. are good. And they will have a mix of both. So and they will have a mix of the both. The margin goes up. Exactly. So some. So I mentioned Indoco for instance. So Indoco has 10% under NLEM, 90% outside NLEM. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you would have something like an FDC, mm -hmm. which is 40% under NLEM, 60% right. outside NLEM. Mm -hmm. So to each company is its own. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, all these products still make very good margins. Right. Because despite price being capped, that price is still good enough to give them very good gross margins. Mm -hmm. So for instance, FDC makes 70% gross margin. It's a very healthy gross sure, margin. Sure. Yeah. Even though 40% of their product is under NLEM, mm -hmm. but they still make 70%. Indoco makes 67, 68% gross margin. So, but one quick, quick, quick question here, yeah. Aditya. So, doctor keeps getting, I mean, there are a lot of MRs, medical people, they keep meeting. Yeah. And we see a lot of overnight changes in terms of these brands, yeah. uh, you know, going away from the market and new brands, new categories coming Yes. In. So, do you see that because there are more than 600 companies now listed, so how do you see that which are the one which is really consistent? Correct. So, you let the numbers do the talking, number one. So, you look at a 10 year track record of the company. Sure. See, it's okay for the company to launch 20 brands and then realize that only 5 of those 20 brands are going to be big brands. Mm -hmm. So, they will keep those 5 alive, they will remove the other 15, they will launch another new, new 15 brands. Mm -hmm. Now, out of the other new 15 brands, another 5 they will feel can become big, they will keep those 5, the other 10 they will move out then right. again they will launch another 10 brands mm. and then you know that is how this business is done right, right. you have to keep launching you have to keep you know sort of testing the waters mm. for the brand and if your brand seems like it's going to become a success you keep it sure. it seems like it becomes a tail brand uh, remove it get a new brand mm. a new molecule and try your hands at that that's how the business is done right. across companies right. so it's a test and uh, you know tri trial sure. and error sort of a business sure. and it has worked fantastically um, and the end point is that end of the day the idea is that the product should be a good branded product the customer the doctor should recall the brand and the company should make good decent margin selling it mm. so i think that business model has survived for ages it will continue to survive for ages okay so this is a business that we really really like uh, it is only 24 25 percent of the index we have about 40 percent of our portfolio in this bucket mm -hmm. uh, we really are overweight on this bucket because we feel it's a fmcg business available at cheaper than fmcg valuations right. far far lower than fmcg valuations and um, the business is just very secular 
and high ROE business. Mm -hmm. So we really, really like this bucket. Sure. The third bucket that we focus on is the API bucket. Now, mm -hmm. this is a slightly controversial bucket. Why? In 1980s, uh, India used to be the leader of APIs in the mm -hmm. world. We used right. to sell API to everybody in the world. Then API is a highly polluting activity. So when you manufacture APIs, there's a lot of pollution. So therefore, India always had very tight pollution controls. So back in 1980s, if you were manufacturing some API, let's say for 100 rupees, 15 rupees, one five, 15 rupees used to be the cost of pollution control. Mm -hmm. So we had that very tight pollution control, so we had that cost. But we were still the leaders in the world. Then what happened was in 1990s, China came up with industrial park policies. And these industrial parks, China said, create capacity for API and chemicals. And you don't need to do pollution control. Oh. Therefore, whatever we were manufacturing for 100 rupees, China was suddenly overnight available mm -hmm. and able to manufacture it for 85 rupees. Mm -hmm. Now, because that happened, all of our market share shifted to China over the last three to four decades. Mm -hmm. Now, today we stand at a point where China has also implemented those pollution norms. Mm -hmm. China's power cost has gone up. China's labor cost has dramatically yeah. gone up. Yeah. And now all those cost arbitrages that China had versus India in API are virtually gone. So okay. today the cost of producing the same API in India and China is pretty much neck to neck. Okay. So then these customers who had early migrated to China are saying, why should we continue to buy only from China mm -hmm. if India is also available to give me the same product at a similar price? Right. And given China's now relations with the Western hemisphere of our world, you know, those countries are saying that too much reliance on China mm -hmm. for anything is not a good signal. Right. 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 So they are also looking to de-risk their supply chain as they call so it. So do you really see in terms of number this API uh, is really growing in India and what was the size and what is the size now in 5, 6 years or 10 years of data points? So we actually don't know the exact size. What we know is the export numbers because sure. that's official data. Right. How much API get consumed in our country? Yeah. There is no official data there. So India used to uh, India used to ex uh, last data that we have is China exports forty billion dollars. India exports four billion dollars of API. Okay. So what we are hoping for is China loses ten to twenty percent market share, mm -hmm. which is not a big number honestly, given the sentiments right. for China today. And if China loses say 10% market share, India's revenue will double. Right. If China loses 20% market share, our revenue trebles. Mm -hmm. Another interesting data point here to monitor is the CAPEX. So if you look at, let's say, just as an example, let's sure. take DVs, which is yeah. the largest API yeah. company that yeah. we know. So DVs started in 1982. By 2017, DVs had a total gross block of 1800 crores. Mm -hmm. Now, if you divide that 1800 crores by 35 years of DVs existence, it means roughly 50 crores of capex per year DVs used to do. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2023 end, DVs is likely to have a total gross block of 6000 crores, okay. which means by two, from 2017 to 2023, DVs would have done capex of 4200 crores, oh. which is an average capex of 700 crores a year versus earlier hundred of Huge 50 number. crores a year. Mm -hmm. So from 50 to 700, there's something happening, right? Mm. Companies do such enormous capex only when they have visibility of order book. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, pharma companies like DVs don't announce their order books, but we have it in good authority that they have a good quality order book. They have a large order book. Mm. And DVs is again just an example. There are multiple other API right, companies right. which are all doubling, trebling, quadrupling their capacity mm -hmm. because they have such high order books. Mm -hmm. So we don't have DVs in our portfolio, for instance, right. because we have issues with the valuation, etc. Sure. But uh, we have other API companies in our portfolio mm -hmm. and they are doing phenomenally well in terms so of... So how does a special chemical companies fit Spe into this API? Yeah, okay. yeah, so specialty chemical is actually very interesting. It's a bucket that we have been studying for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, specialty chemical is actually a bit of an abuse term as well. So see, chemical in itself is pretty unbranded and undifferentiated. Mm -hmm. But when they say specialty chemical, they mean that it is somehow differentiated or difficult to make or difficult to synthesize and therefore some people have an edge over others mm -hmm. in making that. My experience from pharma tells me that today whatever is specialty chemical, five or ten years down the road it may not remain specialty chemical because today whoever is making that is making extraordinary margins mm -hmm. and very high top line growth yeah now if they are able to do that i'm sure their competitors will say yeah and there i saw some small companies be growing 10 times in exactly. last uh, five so, six years time. yeah yeah so see when that happens that attracts competition mm -hmm. and you're not doing something at least in my understanding yeah, from but when i talk to those companies they say that you know because china uh, they are shifting from China yes. to India, therefore they still have a lot of visibility going on. Exactly. So, uh, order book visibility is there, mm -hmm. right? So, next five years are great, no doubt. 
my question is beyond that five. You see, you're not paying a five times multiple. Right. right. You're paying a 30, 40, 50 yes, multiple. Yes, right. Yes. So my question is beyond the next five years. Mm -hmm. Because if I am a competitor and I have enough capital, I am an entrepreneur, I have enough capital, and I see you making 40% return on equity by making some chemicals. Right. Why wouldn't I do it? But would they not have more to any kind of mode because these are unique thing in nature and the yeah, product so, is... Uh, yeah, so that is what they want to put forward. Mm -hmm. We studied it. We could not arrive at the conclusion that there is any more. It's I just see. chemistry. Okay. Right? So you have hired a few chemical engineers, a few people in your R&D to understand how to synthesize a particular molecule or how to be excellent in one chain of chemistry, let's like say okay. benzene or whatever, fluorine. Uh, but I don't understand why I can't hire another bunch of chemical engineers okay. and R&D people and hire some, some of them from your company. Right. If you are the greatest, maybe hire some of them from you. Okay. And uh, you know, build my own benzene and fluorine uh, chain. Right. So story is cooked a lot to large extent. Over I there, think yeah. so. I I would so that is why we have never touched a spe uh, spec chem company sure, at all. Sure. Uh, we have always felt that this is a sector which is peak profit, peak multiple sort of situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we would like the profits to normalize before we evaluate those companies. Yeah, because, because it is highly affected in last. 14 15 months of time frame if you look at yeah, I'm, i would not be surprised if it's affected for the next five years yeah simply put see uh, unless you have what truly differentiates you in the world is two things technology and brand mm -hmm. by and large you know right. uh, so if there is no branding especially chemical clearly mm -hmm. there is maybe a chemistry related technological edge here and there but is that edge sustainable or not a two year three year five year track record is just not enough and you know all these chemical companies have become big in the last right, two three five right, years right. i would like to see them to do this continuously for 10 years mm -hmm. before i put my money in it sure. i've seen these pharma companies for 20 years mm -hmm. before i put my money in them right. so i want to see them for at least 10 years before i put my money in them and then maybe i'll decide to invest in them if they're able to show me that there is a moat right. then i would bend down and i would say yes there is one and i would invest sure, sure. but today i can't understand that moat. so i'm staying away from point but yeah what i can tell you is what has happened in chemicals in the last five years is very likely going to happen in API in the next five years. Mm. See, API also doesn't have branding, but API also have chemistry modes. There are certain APIs which are five-step APIs, or certain APIs are 50-step APIs. Mm. As in, there are 50 manufacturing steps involved mm. in manufacturing one API. There are certain APIs which still can manufacture in two to five steps. Mm -hmm. So again, the 50, 40-step manufacturing is a tough task, right? right? And there will be some uh, limited competition window of 10, 15, 20 years for these sure, companies. Sure. And that is where we feel that you know, some of these API companies have become really, mm -hmm. really big. Mm -hmm. So that, is that was your third bucket. Yeah, that's my third bucket. So that bucket is about 15-16% in the index, 15-16% in our portfolio. Sure. The fourth bucket that we really, really like is the hospital bucket. Now the hospital bucket we like because uh, historically hospitals have not been a great uh, money maker for investors. Right. The reason for that largely was that hospitals really never, uh, you know, were asset light. They always used to own the land and building, which made the balance sheet really heavy and which made expansion really, really debt heavy. True. Because every time I had to borrow a lot to right. expand. Of the last 10 years now, hospitals have figured out that there is something called an asset light model. You don't need to own the land and building. You lease it. Even the medical equipments now, some of the hospitals are not buying out forward. They're taking it on rent, on lease. Right. So what is happening is in very less amount of money, they're able to expand much faster mm -hmm. because they're not owning the asset, they're yeah. leasing the asset. Yeah. And that has resulted in lower margins because you have to pay rental for everything versus earlier you're not paying any rental. But that has improved ROI dramatically because the balance sheet has just shrunk in size versus earlier balance sheet needs to be really, really heavy. Mm -hmm. So we, we think hospitals will be a fantastic phenomenon. Uh, Heal in India as an objective, Indian government has talked about Heal in India. Indian government realizes that we are not only the hub for the cheapest drug manufacturing, we are also the hub for the cheapest healthcare in the world. Mm -hmm. So drug manufacturing, they have a PLI, right? which is helping drug right, manufacturing. Right. Now they are going to come out with initiatives to help medical tourism. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know, uh, an average hospital chain in India gets about 10% of their revenue from medical tourism. Mm -hmm. But that 10% of revenue is responsible for 30% of the profit. Because a medical tourist is charged significantly higher than an Indian citizen for the same service and the same product. That's a news to me. <laughs> now, so go to any hospital and give a foreign pass passport and they will tell you that your pricing is different than the Indian citizen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have to pay more but you get the same service and the same product. Right. But the other thing which we realized that there was a lot of problem in terms of the way these hospitals balance sheet used to be managed. Correct. 
Now, yes. do you see really some changes happening when you are reading their balance sheet? Absolutely. So, as I said, they don't expand now, so they don't buy the land and building. Mm-hmm. So, the balance sheet is much lighter now. So, every time they expand, the balance sheet doesn't blow up mm-hmm. and their debt doesn't blow up. Yeah. It's much more disciplined expansion. Because you go to any hospital, you don't see occupancy there. But then, <laughs> yeah, right. when you see the balance sheet, you don't read anything. Yeah, so, exactly. where was the gap and where do you see this gap is bridging no. as, a, as, a, as a fund manager? Sure. So, the gap was in two things, right? So, first gap was the asset heavy mm-hmm. situation that right. existed. Right. Right. That has just been you know taken care of by doing the asset line bit. The second gap was on occupancy. Mm-hmm. So occupancy may earlier hospitals used to think uh, that you know I can do every discipline, multidisciplinary hospitals, right? So you have cancer, you have maternity, you have heart attack, you go to the same hospital, right? So every hospital used to think that I will do everything. Mm-hmm. And therefore, what hap- used to happen was that doctors weren't sure. See, in a hospital, patients mostly come from a doctor referral. Yeah. Right? Now, doctor, if I am a doctor, I am a cardiologist, and this hospital is telling me it can do cancer, it can do cardio, it can do everything mm-hmm. in the world. I am not sure whether my patient will be best taken care of. So now you have seen the emergence of super specialty hospitals. Yeah. Right? So you see Rainbow, which yeah. is a you know children specialist. Yeah. You see HCG, which is a cancer specialist. You see Narayana, it is a cardiac specialist. Right. So on and so forth. So you have multiple hospitals which are now becoming super specialty Mm -hmm. that is taking care of the occupancy Mm -hmm. because now the doctors are very very comfortable if i am a cardiologist i'm very comfortable referring my patient to an arena Mm -hmm. if i'm an oncologist i'm very comfortable referring my patient to a hcg right right? and that is how these hospitals have changed Mm -hmm. and you see their metrics now so uh, they used to make seven eight percent return on equity now they are 24 25 percent return equity businesses by the way barring fmcg Mm -hmm. one of the very few businesses in india that have negative working capital is hospitals. Okay. A negative working capital is a big statement. Mm. It is a statement that I have huge bargaining power versus my customer right. and my vendor. They both, my customer pays me in advance, yeah. I pay my vendor much later. Right. And that means your, your bargaining power. Unlike your hotel industry. Hotel industry is completely opposite. Yeah. They have huge inventories, right. at the huge data cycles. Hospitals don't do that. Yeah. Their negative operating, uh, their negative working capital. Mm-hmm. Negative working capital is also important because every time hospital profit goes by hundred rupees, the cash that they make is one twenty rupees. Their working capital also gives them cash mm-hmm. because every time your base grows, your working right. capital also grows. Yeah. So while they grow their sure. business, they make more cash yeah. than they were making earlier. We are hopeful that this uh, particular bucket should really shape up well. Yeah, they they've done phenomenally well, honestly. Yeah. In fact, even in the past eighteen months, while every other Healthcare sector sub segment has struggled. Right. Hospitals are actually the best performing sub segment. So, how many uh, businesses are listed in those? I mean, just a rough idea and how many? Seven, eight. What is listed the date? So, uh, no, seven, eight uh, are the decent size ones. If you mm. include the smaller ones, about 14, 15 hospitals are listed. Okay. Right. Uh, and But seven, eight are the decent size ones. There sure. are others are too small probably right. to buy. Uh, and what would be the weight like in there? Uh, so, in the index, hospitals are roughly. Uh, 12 13 percent weightage oh, quite a big number yeah and we have about 17 18 percent in our portfolio okay so, so we are way more optimistic than the index on the hospital business okay. and last and the most uh, debatable segment that we really yeah. like is diagnostics mm-hmm. right now when we launched the incred healthcare pms portfolio february of 2021 everybody was saying how much diagnostic will you buy and we said two percent and the index at three percent we were buying two percent we loved the business model. We did not like the price. Okay. For us, it's not only the business model. Mm-hmm. It is the biz- a good business model at a good price is what we look for. Yeah. So they just saying that bhav bhagwan. Bhav bhagwan che. Sure. So really, we were very very uh, you know uh, uh, we were very helpless. That it's a these are a bunch of companies we really really like the business model. We really like the financials, but we, the market prices were just too exorbitant for us to mm-hmm. invest meaningfully in them. So we did not touch mm-hmm. them. And COVID happened, and all these stocks increased, and everybody yeah. you know sort of was asking us, "What are you doing? Why are you not doing yeah, They're down by 60, 70 percent. Some of them are down 80 percent, 70 percent now, yeah. and now we are becoming bullish because it's still the same business model. Okay. But the prices are now much more reasonable. The only thing, the reason why these stocks have fallen 70, 80 percent are two reasons. Number one, they all made great money in COVID during RT-PCR yeah, and antigen yeah, tests, yeah. right? Huge money. That is not recurring anymore. That was never supposed to recur, right? We all knew COVID was not like a structural situation, right? They are the one who actually made a lot of money. Exactly. <laughs> so they made huge money. And we all always knew that was not going to recur. Second, uh, there has been this online competition, you know, of cheaper diagnostic right. tests. And, and I think investors are overly worried mm. as to what that will do 
to the incumbents now my point is this 85 percent of the diagnostic market is unorganized right. so there is plenty of space for new uh, entrants mm. and none of the new entrants will try to take the incumbent head on it just doesn't make sense sure. they will attack the 85 percent unorganized market I first see. Once the unorganized market is gone, they'll probably then, fight amongst yeah, each other, yeah. which is a whole, you know, two, three decade out mm. story. The second thing is, discounting... The story is very strong there, is it? Are it is extremely strong. When See? you compare that with the developed economies. Yeah, yeah. so developed economies, uh, the online platforms and the brick and mortar coexist profitably. Both of them are profitable. Mm. In India, the online platforms are not profitable. They are burning cash. Mm. So they so today one can question the sustainability of those right, platforms, right. but I'm not getting into that. Sure. I'm just saying if you look at the history, so uh, there was this online platform launched in Delhi, discounted online platform in 2014. Mm. It is a company promoted by a former cricketer. Sure. I'm not going to name it. Yeah. But they started in 2014. As of 2021, after seven to eight years of operations, they had 70 crore top line and 45 crore loss. Oh. So in seven to eight years, that discounting digital format gave them nothing. Mm -hmm. And people are now just worried just because it's a bigger house coming with a different name, there will be more disruption. There isn't. Even that house has now started increasing prices of all the tests. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very optimistic and all our work suggests that diagnostic industry, nothing has changed. Okay. And therefore, you know, two years out, one year out, all these perceptions will be just, you know, right. in the opposite direction. People will again be going to buy diagnostic stocks. So you are, you are, you are underweight? We were underweight before the crash of these stocks. And we are now, now overweight. Okay. So we are now about 11% invested in diagnostic stocks. The index is still three. Mm -hmm. We are about 11% in diagnostics. We are okay. very, very optimistic about the future of this right, sector. Right. So this is the outlook on all the five buckets. Sure, and it was sure. a long no, no. answer, but it's a <laughs> no, big thanks sector. Thanks for great insights, Aditya. <laughs> a couple of quick questions now. Sure. So, you know, there's been saying that, uh, uh, you know, your IT and pharma, these are the two biggest a contributor to our economy. Mm. Of late, we are witnessing that somehow the flavor of pharma is going down from an yes. investor point of view. Yeah. IT continues to be at where they are, maybe 10-15% yeah. weight is down due to market correction, but I'm sure it will come up. Okay. What do you think at a broader level, where are we headed as an as an economy in terms of pharma and where do you see 10-15 years down the line? So see, again, uh, the reason why people have this perception that pharma hasn't done well is because they are focusing on the larger pharma companies. Mm, mm, mm. So when you mean far, when you say pharma, you mean probably Sun Pharma or Dr. Eddie or right. Lupin. Large names. Which are the large names. But I am telling you that they do a business which is yeah. not doing well and will likely not do well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the smaller companies, right? right? So a company let's call it Collapse. Mm -hmm. Seven years back the stock price was six years back the stock price was three fifty rupees. Today, like for like the stock price is seventeen hundred rupees. They did a bonus right. in between. So the stock price is eight fifty today, but it is actually seventeen compared to that 350 so in the same time that some of the last stocks are down 30 40 percent mm -hmm. this company has gone up 400 percent 500 percent in that time right, right? Uh, another company rpg life sciences which mm -hmm. is today our top bet mm -hmm. uh, it was some 80 90 rupees uh, mm -hmm. five six years back yeah. today it's 800 rupees right so it's gone 10x in five six years right so when you say that pharma hasn't done well it's perhaps because you are focusing on the larger names mm -hmm. if you focus on some of the apollo hospitals one of yeah. the largest hospital listed right. in india it turned it out very rupees. well yeah. it was 900 rupees six years back today it's 4200 yeah. yeah right so it is five six times right so i am saying that there's a bunch of companies which haven't done well yeah. but that's because the business of pharma that they are in mm -hmm. is completely you know not done well right. and it's probably not do well in the next five years but how is it in the overall size of the markets you when you look at last decade or maybe the two decades back with the right. compare that with the current numbers so india historically the pharma market has grown at 10 to 12 percent per annum mm -hmm. and that will continue to happen it will grow probably even faster mm -hmm. to tell to give you a flavor last 10 years india gdp cagr real is five percent India pharma market CAGR is almost 11%. Mm -hmm. So it grows faster than the overall economy. Mm -hmm. So next 10 years, if you feel that the India GDP will grow at let's say 10% nominal, then India pharma market will grow more than 10%. Mm -hmm. Because see, once roti kapda and makan is taken care of, right. the next incremental disposable income goes mm -hmm. into healthcare. Right. 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 And that is what we have seen with the US economy, we have seen with the Swiss economy, we have seen with the English economy. Right. It is the same everywhere. Right. First the bare essentials. 
and then comes health. Right. So in India today we are at two thousand dollar per capita mm -hmm. GDP. Mm -hmm. That is the threshold. Right. Beyond that threshold, every incremental penny has more and more wallet mm -hmm. share of pharma right. and healthcare than it has for let's say clothing or food or housing. Right. You know, incrementally so more money. My question is that you know, as an investor, mm -hmm. what do you think? What should be my allocation towards pharma? Sure. So globally, most of the markets, the weight of healthcare as an index in their own economy is about ten to fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. In India, because today healthcare is not appreciated as much by investors, it's right. about three and a half, four percent. Right. Right. So I think uh, you you can either invest four five percent today and grow along with the index mm. to get to ten fifteen percent, right. or you can invest fifteen percent today. Right. And when it becomes fifteen percent in the index, you'll probably be forty percent. Mm -hmm. So you already would have made your money. Right. You know, by the time that happens. So we advise investors that at least ten to fifteen percent of their portfolio needs to be in healthcare, right. dedicated money, right. because this is a sector which is still very, very young, very mm. nascent, mm. yet extremely profitable and mm. extremely secularly growing right. in India. So just don't focus on the exporters. That is where a majority of the mistakes are made. Mm. Mm. Focus on the Indian consumption right. of healthcare. You will not go wrong. Mm. Mm. The other thing is we see a lot of uh, organic food and organic people are becoming more health conscious as you rightly said the roti kapda and makan is done now right. at 3 3.5 trillion dollar of economy right. now we are heading towards disposable income now do you think some kind of uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, growth will be witnessed in three four years down the line because people becoming more health conscious and suddenly you see that these ah, so see covid has done that already right so pre covid how many people you know wanted to get their eyesight checked right. how many people wanted to get their bp or their heart right, checked right. now if anything small happens to you you know people are rushing to the doctor earlier it was dud and haldi hmm. you know kuch bhi hua dud haldi is fine right well uh, said abhi abhi dud haldi nahi <laughs> covid mein samajh mein aaya dud haldi doesn't work correct, correct. as much right Right. So, yes. so now you go to the doctor a lot more. Yeah. So yeah. it has already begun, Vikash. That trend has started. Mm -hmm. People, for even the smallest of issues, want to right. go to the doctor and right. check as to what is happening. Right. And this can only potentially grow. See, uh, understand this. We are becoming more westernized in our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That means more computer, less walking, yeah. more cars, more electronic gadgets on right. us. Electrification of the environment around us mm -hmm. will always have an adverse impact on our health. Right. Simply because our body was not supposed mm -hmm. to be electric. Well said. We are supposed to be organic. Right. <laughs> but we are not. What we are doing, none of it is organic. Yeah, yeah. But that's the modern lifestyle, right? right. And, and you can't get away from it if you have to compete in this world. Right? Yeah. So you will need a support system mm. to help you survive that right, lifestyle, right. and that support system is healthcare. Right, it has started. Right. There's nothing, uh, you know, that we don't know about. It's just that you haven't recognized. Right. You have seen it. Right. You have not noticed it. Right. The other thing is, you know, if you can talk to us about why Incred decided to come out with PMS and that too in pharma, because you know, you generally when you start, you start with your own flagship product like yeah. maybe large cap, then you start mid cap. But mm -hmm. this was the only SM when we, when we don't see too many PMSs operating in this sure. industry. So first of all, thank you for launching this, and this is helping most of our investors to participate in pharma. You Definitely. know, uh, the any views on that? Sure. Uh, so look, uh, in, so there are already eight or nine pharma mutual funds available. Yeah. Now, as I said, in healthcare and pharma, today the biggest challenge is some of your largest, most liquid names are in a business which is not investable. But these mutual funds have thousands of crores mm -hmm. as a UM, mm -hmm. and they have very little opportunity to invest in smaller companies. Yeah. But the branded generic business model, the diagnostic business model, the hospital business model, the API business model, all of this is actually between small and mid caps and micro caps. Mm -hmm. They are the companies of the future. But today they are very very small and illiquid. Yeah. And these mutual funds with thousands of crores of you just can't buy them. Right. Even if they wanted to, they can't. Right. And which is why the need for a PMS exists. Mm. Because I am not a pooled account. Mm. I am an individual account. Right. And because I am an individual account, it is 50 lakhs, 1 crore, 5 crore, 10 crore. I can easily buy into as small a company as I want. Mm -hmm. If I like the business model, if I think it's sustainable profit, right. if I think the valuation is good, I can still buy it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to look for liquidity before I buy. Right, right. That is why the need for this PMS was always there. Right. And that is why we launched it first mm -hmm. before we launched any other product. Right. Yeah. So Aditi, what I wanted to also talk to you about is uh, so uh, you know at the current juncture, you know your your portfolio is well positioned and you've got about 80, 85 percent in mid and small cap as we talked about. So can you talk to us about what is the current P in the pharma? 
what is your portfolio be what is the return on equity that you are looking at what is the cash flow that you are looking at all right um, so in terms of our portfolio pe basis uh, one year forward numbers the portfolio is around 18 times pe multiple if you look at the index it's about 20 21 times pe multiple mm -hmm. uh and in terms of roe again one year forward the portfolio roe is about 17 mm -hmm. the index is around 15 15 and a half okay uh and that's again because the index has those large companies mm -hmm. which have low roe right. because they are in the us business right. so that is what bears and those companies are more expensive also mm -hmm. so that is the reason why <coughs> our portfolio p looks lower and our roe looks higher yeah. uh in terms of the cash flow that's a more important question i feel mm -hmm. so the free uh, the operating cash flow yield of our portfolio one year out mm -hmm. is about 6 and 1/2% okay and that of the index is about 4% mm -hmm. now that is again because that us business doesn't give enough cash flow mm -hmm. in the us business if you sell have worth 100 rupees 20 to 30 rupees actually goes into your working capital right, right. the rest only comes in your cash flow so peg turns out to be the pg so pg for our portfolio will be around one because it's about 16.8% return on equity and about 18 times pe multiple right. so 1.1 so from a valuation point of view if you look at it is a good time to enter it it's a fantastic time to enter right. see simply because um, if you look at the 10 year average the sector is currently doing lower than the average 10 year roe mm -hmm. average 10 year roe is 15 the sector is currently doing about 11 mm -hmm. or 10 mm -hmm. and the if you look at the average price to book multiple 10 year so sector is still trading at below price to book for the last 10 years mm -hmm. so when the multiple and the roe both are below average that is the best time to put money mm -hmm. because that's when the roe recovers as a investor you get earning growth and you get multiple dividend right, right. that's how you make more money as an investor yeah. so p instead of being scared when a sector is beaten down right. or a theme is beaten down right. you should actually bull up on it as long as you believe mm -hmm. it will resurrect itself right. it will go back to the normal right. and we have all the signs and all the data to show you that it is actually going back to the normal as sure. we speak sure. so you know this is the right time to invest mm -hmm. in that sense mm -hmm. couple of quick question uh, maybe last two or three questions so Uh, how do you deploy funds? You deploy overnight. You take two, three months time. When somebody is giving you a mandate of fifty lakhs rupees, right? So I'll give you uh, examples. So there are times when we deploy overnight. So if you give me money, let's say in an environment like this, you know, when everything is you know literally dirt cheap, yeah, I would like to deploy it as fast as I can. Sure. Right. But if you if the money comes when the market is in up cycle and we believe valuations mm -hmm. are getting right. a little stretched, right. we can take two to three months to deploy mm -hmm. because then we we become very sticky and choosy on the price at which right. we enter in a stock. Right. Right. So that is how it is. So mm -hmm. it's not a uniform answer. Yeah. It depends on what's happening in the market. Right. Now we come across a lot of uh, professionals, you know, who are uh, at a senior management level in these pharmaceutical companies, and they have a lot of ESOPs already. They got it from the company. Uh, and that their valuations are not going up so they keep asking me what should they do so i always give them uh, this advice that you should uh, diversify your portfolio because you cannot afford to take too much of risk one you are working in the company one anything happens wrong you are you are you know in trouble and then you have all the wealth also associated yeah. with that so what is your opinion on that no so concentration in healthcare as a sector is never advisable mm. so even we you know in our portfolio carry 17 stocks right. it is a fairly concentrated right. portfolio right. but it's still 17 stocks it's fairly right. diversified as right. well uh, we give similar advice to our clients mm. we say that sure. look never tie up your earnings and your wealth everything to one right. you know company right. you need to diversify it right. and uh, because uh, you know it's a sector where things might change it's highly regulated right. Right. Uh, export oriented so currencies change mm -hmm. so you want to always you know uh, sp uh, spread out your bets right. and not be too focused on right. one name right there a lot of investors out there especially l rich and i they feel that when they are investing in diversified pmss their pharma they you know uh, contribution the pharma exposure is done through them right. but do you think that they should have a separate like for example we suggest them that you know you have to have a separate portfolio for fixed income you have to have separate equity exposure and within that i always recommend that you have to have some amount in it and some amount in pharma sure so what do you think about that so see my answer will be biased because i manage a healthcare yeah. pms but let me give you data which is unbiased yeah Had you invested hundred rupees in Nifty ten years back, mm. today it would be worth three hundred rupees. Mm. Had you invested hundred rupees in healthcare companies, but not unbranded generics, mm. not the large companies which yeah. do US, that hundred rupees would become six hundred rupees. Mm. Mm. That so, is where the that is where the real money is being made. The branded generic, the hospital, the API, right. the diagnostic, right, 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 and that is the bucket where we focus on. Mm. Mm. 
So clearly the answer is that you need to have a special dedicated capital for yeah, this sector right. because the sector grows phenomenally securely, mm-hmm. stocks do very, very well, cash flow rich companies, right. very little to no debt. Sure. So really no sensitivity to inflation or interest mm-hmm. rates, right. no down cycles, involuntary consumption. Right, right. Yes, there will be good and bad times in the equity market and there will be good and bad right. times in this portfolio. But the businesses will always give you comfort that they are really doing well. Right. So as an investor, you can have the capacity right. to stay invested for decades. Not for just years, but Great. for decades. Excellent, Adit. It was a pleasure talking to you. Great insights My from pleasure. you. My uh, pleasure. I hope that all our investors out there, they would appreciate the kind of knowledge that you've shared with all of them. And at AIF and PMS Expositia, we keep organizing these knowledge-based sessions and we'll continue to do so. My submission to all of you is please subscribe to our channel so that whenever we do these kind of value-add activities, you are the first one to get to know about it. So thank you so much once again. Thank you for all your love and support. Thank you. Thank you.